journey through us, Lord. We only know a little bit. And the little bit we know is not much at all. Father, we yield ourselves, humble ourselves, so that you can be glorified yes. and into our lives, Lord. Use us as your vessels. Use me as your vessel this morning, Father God. I decrease so that you may increase. Have your way in Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. 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 You can be seated. It's, it's a great thing when God knows your name. Yes. That means you've written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Yes. And when the end comes, he'll be able to do the roll call. And you know that you'll get called yes. by name. Amen. Not hate you, Amen. but by name. That's different, man. Because this world, they hate you. And excuse me, sir, sometimes. Or excuse me, ma'am, sometimes. Or, you know, they don't know your name. It's, you just hate you. It's different when he knows your name. It is definitely different. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Uh, Jesus. He is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. All right. Well, let's get started with today. Uh, let's begin continuing on where we have been for the last couple of weeks, talking about brokenness. Talking about brokenness. Did you get that yet? Focus. Okay. We talk. Hallelujah. You know, like I said, and I mentioned previously, you know, in this world, you know, broken things is thrown out, discarded, sometimes considered useless, right? But God will take broken things to use, <laughs> He'll take broken people to use. You know, if God didn't need us no more, we wouldn't still be here. Not that he beat us on that level. So understand what I'm saying without trying to tear us down, tearing him down, talking about what do you mean God need you? Yeah, he do. This, I mean, I need him more than he need me. Right? Psalm 34 says, in verse 18, the Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and save it such as be of a contract spirit. He said the Lord is nigh or close to those that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contract spirit. Right? Damaged goods are rejected in the world standard. That includes people and things. If it's damaged, either you're going to pay to get it fixed um, listen to what I'm saying, y'all. If it's damaged goods, either you're going to pay to get it fixed or you're going to get rid of it. God said, I already paid the price to fix you. And I ain't trying to get rid of you. But it's so many people because of pride, self will, stubbornness, selfish habits, sinful habits, uh, distractions. That's just a couple of examples of things that cause people to first not get broken and then feel like, you know, I, I am of no use, right? The Bible said that God will break those that are proud and rebellious. See, a person that has pride and they're proud and they're rebellious, they don't they think that it's okay. They think that they're all right. They haven't considered the whole. They only consider the part. Which part? The part that they think makes them happy. Right? But then, you know, the, the proud person don't know that they are proud. 
A rebellious person don't think that they've been rebellious. They just think that I'm just doing what I want to do. I'm just doing me. Right? And as long as you're doing you, you can't be doing him. As long as you're doing your will, you can't do his will. Because Jesus said, in the garden, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Right? So the proud and the rebellious got to break. You know, like you, you, you look at the story of Pharaoh. Pharaoh was proud and rebellious. Pharaoh thought that he was the man, but God broke him in order to free his people. He confused him. He had him lost. And sometimes when we're in a state of confusion and we feel like we're lost, we're going through a breaking. But we we don't know how to handle it if we're not really in communion and in conversation with God. It just seems like it's just so much. I don't know. I mean, there's so much going on right now. I don't know what to do. But when you don't know what to do, you call on him. And when you call on him, let me see. I don't want no interruptions. When you call on him, then he'll tell you what to do. But if you go call on him and you don't know who he is, then you won't know what to do. Right? I'm just, come on, y'all. Walk with me. Stay with me just a little bit. Can you not tear it? For an hour? <laughs> Seriously. Just stay with me for an hour. I mean, it might be a little bit more than an hour, but just stay with me. Bear with me. Walk with me. See that? Now, now that we're switching up, you know, uh, communication devices, you know, preachers preach with a handheld. So I might be ready to get some preaching and not so much of teaching today. Right? But when God had to break Pharaoh, it was, it was, it made him feel like, well, some would feel like when they're going through the breaking from God. Remember, breaking is good and bad. We said that. We, we you know, I really explain the good and bad of breaking. Right? So when God is breaking you, that's a good thing, but it seems like it's bad. You know, and then for the prideful or the arrogant, it's a bad thing, but it's turning off for the good. All things work together for the good that goes to call by the Lord. And they love him. Right? Look at Leviticus. 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 Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. If you get to Genesis, you, then you look at Exodus, and then you get to Leviticus. 26. Leviticus 26. It says in verse 13. Leviticus 26, 13. It says, I am the Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt, that ye should not be their bondmen, and I have broken, broken the bands of your yoke and made you upright. He said he broken the bands of your yoke. What's a yoke? Something that's trying to keep you captive got you yoked up. That, that's controlling you. That's holding you captive. Right? To us, like I said, to us, broken things are despised and, and they're worthless. But God can take what has been broken and remake it into something even better. Something that he can use for his glory. Broken things and broken people are the result of sin. Broken things and broken people are the result of sin. But God sent his son, Jesus, who was without sin to be broken so that we can be put back together and be healed. But people they don't want to accept Jesus. You don't want to accept Jesus, you'll remain broken in a bad way. You accept Jesus, you're going to get broken in a good way. All right, all right. 
Isaiah 53 said, Isaiah 53, 5 says, he was bruised, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our inequities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his, his wounds and by his strength, we are healed. So he had to get broke so that we can be healed. And, but the amazing thing is, God says, I got to break you so that you can be healed. But Jesus was broken and wounded and took the strength so that we can be healed. We confess it when we're going through when we're going through any kind of illness, we got sickness, we, man, by his stripes I'm healed. By his stripes I'm healed. We're confessing it, confessing it, confessing it, confessing it. Yeah, we won't embrace it. You can say it, but not believe it. Didn't he say they have eyes, but they can't see? Matthew 13, it, it, all in line with the, cerebral, with the parable of the sower. He said they have ears to hear, but they can't hear. He to have an eye, let him see. He to have an ear, let him hear. We confess it and confess it and confess it. But are we really embracing the brokenness? We don't want to embrace it. Then it just seems like we just keep going full circle. Man, I have been through this too many times. We say that. Man, this thing is keep going on and on and on. But the only way to really get past it is embrace the brokenness. And the only way to embrace the brokenness is when we surrender our life to Christ. Then and only then can we be restored and transformed and put back together. But in order to surrender, it requires a brokenness on our part. Luke 9. Come on. I ain't saying run, but walk fast. Luke 9. Luke 9. And the only way to surrender and to embrace your brokenness is you got to get forget about you. Forget about how you feel. Forget about what you want to do. Forget about what you think. Forget about what you said. Forget about what they said to you. That got you so confused and got you so bound up and got you yoked up. Luke 9. Y'all there? Yeah. This, this, look. <clears throat> All right, this right after he, this, this right after he performed a miracle. Right after he performs a miracle, he comes right back and says this in verse 22. Let's start there. Saying, the son of man must suffer. Many things to be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and to be slain and be raised the third day. And he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. But what is a man advantage if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? But whatsoever shall be ashamed, but whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his fathers and of the holy angels. He says, the only way you can come after him, so the only way you can surrender to him is if you deny yourself. Be broke. Be broken. Get yourself out the way. It ain't about me. It's all about him. Till we get to that point in our surrendering, the brokenness won't occur. <clears throat> we have to surrender to be broken. Right? And then even, and even in, the, in the midst of the surrendering and the brokenness that we're experiencing, we're still claiming the promise. That he said, okay, I understand, Lord, in this world, I'm going to have troubles. It's going to be some tough times. It's going to be some hard times. I ain't confessing that. I'm not having a negative confession. I understand what I'm saying. You human, you're going to go through something. Uh, hear what I said. If you're human, you're going to go through something. Yeah, if you're human, it's like the song said when she was just saying, if he know your name, no mountain can stop you. But it's too much. 
Instead of going through the mountain or going through the situation, or going through the circumstance or going through the suffering, we stop at the mountain and gaze at it and get caught up by it and see how big it is. Instead of going through the suffering, we start confessing. Man, this is so hard, huh? This is so, this is so challenging. I don't know how to get through it. And then when we, once we do that, with the mountain and the suffering and the challenges, we begin to isolate ourselves. And when you isolate yourself, you'll be all by yourself. And then we just got done reading this right here. You're not denying yourself. You're, you're saying in your head, you're like, my God is able. But really, the surrendering and the trusting in him to show that he's able, we won't keep moving. We'll stop. Get paralyzed. I don't know how I'm going to do it. That's fear. Because you ain't supposed to do it. It's him that's doing it. He that begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ. But are we? do we really believe that he will perform it? Somebody, I, I ran into somebody uh, uh, last Friday, Thursday. And they was just sharing with me. It's like, man, look, man, keep going through what you're going through. What do you mean going through what I'm going through? You're not going through anything. But all, 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 the, all the individual was saying is, no, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. It doesn't matter what it looks like. All, and that's the whole thing of when we come to that suffering, we come to that challenge, we come to that mountain, it doesn't matter what it looks like. I just know that God is. I just know that God will. I just know that God can. That's where the trust, reliance, and dependence is all on him. It ain't got nothing to do with me. If it don't happen, then, you know, like Moses told him, well, I'm going to tell him, it's you. Well, Lord, if you don't do this, how are they going to look at me? No. It is what it is. To God be the glory. Everybody ain't supposed to be uh, sitting high and looking low. Some people got to stay low so they can keep their eyes high. Keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faces, Hebrews 12 says. Right? Hallelujah. John 16, 13. John 16, 33 said, said this, look. I, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. But we won't embrace it. We believe it. I will say we believe it. And that promise right there cannot be broken. But we won't break ourselves to really receive that promise. Psalm 34 continued on back then. It says, a righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers from them, him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of his bones will be broken. I don't know how I'm going to handle this. This going to stop saying it's going to take you out. Stop saying it's going to kill you. He said right here, yes, you will have many troubles, but God will deliver, deliver you from them all, and not a bone of your body will be broken. The Lord redeems his servants. No one will be condemned. He takes refuge in him. Right, we gotta, we gotta put up. We gotta, if we're gonna have our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, we gotta start seeing things the way that Jesus seen it, the way that Jesus seen it, the, the, the way that Jesus seen it, down it, seen it, S E E D E D. He planted that inside of us. We gotta start looking at things in the light of eternity, and be fixed on that, knowing. That we keep our eyes fixed on the author and finisher of our faith. The author, one version says the author and finisher. Another version says the author and perfecter of our faith. Who for the who they say who for the joy that was set before him he endured. See, people can't get through get to brokenness because they don't want to endure. I don't want to go through this. You don't want to endure. If you don't endure, you won't be strengthened. If you don't endure, you won't be wise. 
If you don't endure, you won't get direction. If you don't endure, you'll never know what you, what's on the other side of the endurance. Seriously. God, God, why do I gotta go through this? You're a man. Some things is built. Some things is made for you to go through because you're built for it. But it's like, man, I, don't, I ain't built for this. Why me? Why is he, why me or woe is me? Which one? So, turn to Matthew 5. Matthew 5. Y'all with me still? Yeah. I need to start preaching yet. Matthew 5, the Beatitudes, as they call it, right? Verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see, they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. He said, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. What I'm rejoicing and being exceedingly glad for because I got broke. I won't get the blessing unless I'm getting broken. Why won't you let me do that, Lord? Why haven't you given me a release? Well, because we haven't allowed the inner man or the innermost man, the spirit of God, to be released. The broken part. Y'all remember the egg analogy, right? Yeah. Are you willing to be broken from your flesh and your feelings so that you can get to the innermost man so that he can break forth in our life? Hallelujah. God will draw us to a broken state. Sometimes God will call us to a broken state, right? But he longs for us to come to him so that he can heal us, so that he can use us, so he can move us, right? But oftentimes we're unable to hear his voice because we're so busy with other things, namely ourselves or our jobs or our families or our problems or our unhappiness or our situation or our circumstance. Wait a minute. But just morning in prayer, you said, Lord, I give it all to you. Then how is it still yours? If you gave it, if you give something away, it's no longer yours. And if you deny yourself, which means you gave yourself away, you're no longer yours. Do, do, do you hear me? You feel me? You understand me. It ain't about you, but it is about you. Because you're in the way. I got to I gotta allow myself to be broken so I can get out of the way. Sometimes we got to be broken before we really, really, before we really realize our need for the Lord. Hallelujah. And, and no, you will never find a solution in all these books that you read. You'll never find a solution in your deep meditation on stuff you need to do. You'll never find a solution in yourself. The only solution in, in effort is only found in him. And it only comes from him. Right? Only when we recognize our need for God are we able to take our eyes off ourselves and focus them on God and Jesus. If we don't realize that need for God like that, we'll never, we'll always be looking in the mirror. And the, what a horrible sight we see in the mirror. What we think is so glamorous. That look, 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 even, even the world is infiltrated in, in a certain kind of way. Because people get so fixated on themselves, you take a selfie. 
You get fixated on yourself. You study that selfie out to try to make it look good for everybody else. I mean, you're just thinking about yourself. Selfie. Self. I, the example. Self, I E. What's an I E? It's an example, right? Mm. Hallelujah. Only when we admit our need to ask God into our life, to control our life, can God to begin to make us whole. Until we get to that need of everything, Lord, I don't know what to do about this. I don't know what to do and really give it to him. And there's, when, you know when you really get, give it to him, you just start thanking him for getting it done. You don't keep revisiting it. You know what I'm saying? You give it to him, and then why you, why you, why you even gave it to him, and you're walking away from it? Well, thank you, Lord. You ain't even looking back at it. Just thank you, Lord, that that's done. Thank you, Father God, that you handled that. Thank you, Lord. All thank, look, look, thank you, Lord. All things work together for my good. Thank you, Lord, for your freedom and your liberty. Thank you for your deliverance. Thank you for freeing me up of a crazy and negative mindset. Not negative like the world would say, but negative and I haven't been thinking the Lord like you told me to think. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We have to surrender to God and allow him to make us whole. To give our life meaning and purpose. We're too busy trying to find out what our meaning and purpose is, but we don't want to involve God in it. We're too busy trying to find out the meaning and purpose of our life, but we don't want to involve God in it. We have to trust him. We got to trust him. Broken people trust God. Because they can't put themselves back together. And, and it, let, let me tell you, let me, let me, I'm going to tell you a secret. You know, when somebody trying to tell you a secret, they seem like they both get lower, like they're trying to whisper to you. <laughs> there is not a person on the face of the earth that's walking around, moving and breathing, that is not experiencing brokenness at one point or another. There is not a person that's walking around that is not even experiencing brokenness right now. Some people are embracing it for the good. Other people are avoiding it and don't know that it's all bad. Because the thing that God says, let go of and let me control, they ain't got both their hands on it. So that's the secret for today. You can tell somebody, I went to church and I found out something. I was told a secret. They say, what's the secret? No one makes it through life without being broken. Amen. Right? We would have broke pencils. We would have broke promises. You'd have broke Christian ornament, Christmas ornaments. You'd have, broke, you'd have had some, some promises broken to you. Some people have broken their bones. Many of us have broken friendships. Some people have broken dreams and some have experienced a broken heart. Right? Some people got a, got a high fever where your temperature was and you said, man, what did you say? Man, this fever got a break. So even in things uh, and a fever may come to, to build up our immune system. But it still has to break so the immunity can come forth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Some of us have uh, uh, so many Breakings are occurring on the inside on a regular basis that we just our, our feelings are all over the place, all over the place. We feel a certain way about everything. We feel a certain way about everybody. We look at people sideways. We look at people upside down. We look at people right ways. We look at people, we have we have this this stigma about us that when we're around certain when we're around certain people or we're around people. See people that if you're being broken and you're not embracing it. You avoid people. You isolate yourself. But if you're around people and you're embracing their brokenness, somebody is coming to mend a part of you. Because God's going to make sure of that. It's worse than, than my wife told me, gave the story and the analogy about the person. And we, yeah, we went to the Creation Museum yesterday and I was like, wow, the people on the rock by themselves 
And I wonder if they said with that lady that was sitting on the rock by herself. When it flooded out. I'm not going to bleed God to save me. Helicopter come. Come on, throw the ladder down. Come on, ma'am, jump on. No, I'm trusting God. Ma'am, we're here to help you. I'm just trusting God. Helicopter said, well, there's other people that need our help. Let her just keep trusting God. Boat come. Ma'am, get on the boat. Come, jump, jump, jump onto the boat. I'm just going to stay right here. I'm trusting God. Believing God's going to save me. <clears throat> Ma'am, jump, come on. Well, let's go get some other ones. She's just going to keep trusting God. Another one. Raft. Build on the raft. Here, I got a life vest. Take the life vest. Come on. I want to help you. I'm just trusting God. I'm just believing God. And like, like raft, man, the water getting higher, man. Let me go on. Eventually, water gets up, kills the lady, takes her out. She's saved. Get to heaven? Lord, I ask about one question. How did you leave me on a rock and not save me? He said, man, I sent three people in your way to save you and help you. But you didn't want to embrace that. You made it here, though. But you could have still been there doing what I asked you to do. But you ain't want to embrace the brokenness because you said, my God. Just wanted to keep, I'm just waiting. Y'all remember the song? Wait, wait, waiting on the Lord, waiting on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord. I'm just waiting. Wait. Waiting on. Come on, stop waiting. And start doing. But see, you only can do when you're broke. And when you're broken, God will lead, God and instruct you. Right? There's a whole lot of ways to be broken. From our souls to our fingertips. Brokenness is woven through all of us. But we won't embrace it. Broken is designed for all of us to embrace, grab hold of, take on. You know, the stuff that you keep in the closet. You, somebody come over your house. You try to do a hurry up, a rush job to clean up. You just throw everything under the bed or in the closet. And it looks like your room is clean or your house is clean. But God is like, no, no, no. Let me kick down the closet door, turn over the bed to get all that rubbish out because it's really in the way. And that's how a lot of people are living. They're living as if they think that they're broken, but they've not experienced the broken. They just try to stuff, 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 stuff away in the closet or under the bed. And they think, I'm good. Well, praise God. Hallelujah. Share this if God loves you. And God is like, why are you sharing that stuff? You're just sharing something that people can see. But then doesn't the, word, doesn't the Bible says God doesn't look on the outward. He looks on the inward. And God is like, no, it's that stuff on the inside. Why would you put new wine in old wineskins? Jesus used that parable. He's like, no, 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 no. You get new wineskins and put new wine in it. Because if you put new wine in the old wineskin, it's going to burst. But God said, I ain't going to give you new wine skin until you let me get rid of the old stuff on the inside. And once I get rid of the old stuff on the inside, oh, now I can give you new wine skins and now I can fill you up with fresh new wine. Hallelujah. Glory, glory to God. Don't, let's, let's not keep moving through life and miss the point of the brokenness or miss the meaning of the brokenness. Right? Brokenness might, might not be a foreign concept to some of us. It may not be. It might be something new to somebody else. It may be something old to somebody else. But it never is a foreign concept to any of us. Because we know we got we, we to we deal with it. And the reason it's a foreign concept is because some people misunderstand it. What do you mean when you say brokenness? Meaning just let God infiltrate your whole life. Don't, come, don't, don't live a compartmentalized life. Your whole life should be a whole. God want to make us whole. So he brings us to get rid of those compartments so he can put us back together. 
right? Ain't nothing wrong with having rooms in a house, but God don't want us to have, ooh, Jesus, I almost dropped the mic. God, ain't nothing wrong with having rooms in a house, but God don't want us to have rooms in our life. That room is off limits. Why? Because that's when I was hurt. That's when I was abused. That's when I was mistreated. Don't nobody need to know about that. That room's off, 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 the, off, off limits too. Why is that one's off limits? Because that's the one where my mom and my dad told me I wouldn't amount to nothing. That room is off limits too. You can't go in there. God don't want us to have rooms in our life. Hallelujah. We'll build a prayer closet. We'll build a study in our physical, material home. But God says, no, 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 no. I don't need you to have a prayer room and a, and a study in your life. Man, come on, y'all feeling what I'm saying? He said, I don't want compartments. I don't want rooms. I want access to the whole thing. Open up all the doors. Seriously, people come, people come over to our physical house. We, I mean, you come over, the bed is made every day. Every bed in all the bedrooms is made every day. So the doors stay open. Oh, they coming over, man. Close that the bed. Ain't. Man, God is like, that's when you're trying to close me off in areas that I want to get to. Jesus. You close me out like the lady on the pole. I'm sending somebody to do a room, to do an inspection on that room, and you're just like, no, 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 no. They don't need to buy that. Mm -mm. No. Mm -mm. But that ain't number pride. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Mm -hmm. And even if you think about it, I don't want I don't want us talking about brokenness to become something trendy or the new fad that somebody will hear. No, 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 no. It, it, it's, it's, to, it's to expose our messiness and our imperfections so that God can clean up the mess and perfect the imperfections. We don't want it to turn out to be something where it's so self-righteous or something that we twist and turn and it's like we're asking for pity. We're having a pity party. Because I don't know, I don't know how to deal with it. Pastor, talk to me. That's a pity party. Because do you? When we're really, seriously, when we're really saying, I need to talk to somebody, are we really talking to somebody? All right? I need to talk to somebody. Are we doing like this? You know what I'm saying? I need to talk to somebody. I'm just, I'm going to just address it in front of you. Just, are we, are we, are we, are we doing it? Are we, are we letting everybody just, I ain't going to undress, but do you, you get my point? Or we just, some, we don't want them to know everything. We only let them in different parts. The parts that we feel comfortable talking about. But God has said, no, I want you to be uncomfortable in this brokenness. Because if you're just in your comfort level, then I can never make you comfortable. But when you get uncomfortable, God has said, that's what, that's what I want. But he says right here, blessed are they that mourn, where they should be comforted. You're crying about stuff. And God has said, what are you crying about that for? I'm trying to comfort you. That's good. Let it out. Because if we can get it out, we can keep it out. But if we can't get it out, we can't keep it out. Because if, if you put something out, will you get, ah, oh, Jesus, oh, hallelujah. If we if you stand and you got the screen door and a fly in, I get this fly out of my house, get it out. And you open the door and another fly come in. But once you get it out, you keep it out. Because you just close the door back. The pride, get it out and keep it out. The selfishness, get it out, keep it out. That I want to do what I want to do, get it out, keep it out. But if you want to talk to somebody, but you ain't willing to just start taking off the layers, you ain't really, uh, uh, you ain't, whew. you don't want real help. 
You really just want self-help. Because what's not exposed can be helped. What layers are not exposed can't be helped. What challenges that's not exposed can't be helped. What situations that's not exposed can't be helped. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And even though this brokenness is being threaded through our lives, because it's intricately woven into our lives, well, we must experience it. We must go through it. Ah, oh, Jesus. I don't think it, I don't think the real meaning is sinking into a lot of us. It's just looking at the surface. Like, I let God in this room. And it ain't like he don't know what's in the other room anyway. Right? I mean, it's almost like, Adam, where are you? It ain't like he didn't know. He was looking for the transparency, vulnerability, and exposure. And even brokenness, we can't use it in this world like this. I'm this super, I'm this, this superhero spiritual person. Well, I'm so humble. If you gotta tell somebody you're humble, you really ain't humble. Humility speaks for itself. It doesn't need a crowd. Brokenness speaks for itself. It doesn't need a crowd. Seriously. Hallelujah. <laughs> So let, don't even try, don't even settle for a trendy or 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 uh, ice or right. don't don't settle for a trendy use of brokenness for pity or trying to be a supernatural hero. Just let me just embrace it, man. Let me just embrace it. Right and now, get, I, I can give you the points now. That was just the sermon. The whole points. We're broken because of ourselves. We're broken because of ourselves. Because this kind of this kind of brokenness that we're broken because of ourselves, that's an inward breaking. Right? David went through this after he bugged out, tripped out, watched a woman from the rooftop. And Nathan had to call him on it. Sorry. Had to throw myself in here. <laughs> Right? But David experienced a broken and a contract spirit. A contract spirit over our own selfishness, which leads to humility, surrender, and a true godly repentance. True godly repentance. You know, people say you need to repent. They can repent, but if it ain't true godly repentance, there ain't no surrender and there's no humility. You just said it just to be saying it, to get through, to go through the motions. Right? It's painful to look into an honest mirror and see who we really are and what we've done as a person that's capable of doing so many horrible things, capable of destroying somebody else's life, capable of cutting somebody sharper with our words than with a blade or a butcher knife. Say what I want to say, but just say what I feel. Okay. Then you ain't really had true sorrow and godly repentance, and you need to break yourself. You need to start allowing God to work on the inner parts. Right? He did, now we, I mentioned David. Now think about Peter. Turn turn to Mark. David is Psalm 51. You know that all day long. And look, look, look at look at Peter after he after he denied Christ. Mark 14. After he denied Christ. <clears throat> and Jesus already told him that, that he said before the cock grow twice. After, after Peter had the butterfly revelation, I'm going to follow you. I'll never deny you. You are the son of God. All of this. And then check it out. Verse 66. 
Mark 14, 66. And as Peter, as Peter was beneath in the palace, there coming one of the maids of the high priest. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked upon him and said, And thou also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But but he denied, saying, I know, I know not, neither understand what thou sayest. And he went out into the porch and the cock crew. And a maid saw him again and began to say to them that stood by, This is one of them. And he denied it again. And a little after, they that stood by said again to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thou art a Galilean, and thy speech agreeeth thereunto. But he began to curse and to swear. Remember, remember, let's let's stop for a second. Remember what I was telling you? When you don't want to embrace the brokenness, when you seem like you're confused, you seem like you're crazy, you see like a whole lot is going on, you kind of get aggravated, frustrated, mad. At yourself and everybody else that's around you. Peter, he started cussing and swearing. I know not this man of whom you speak. Because he never did not embracing the brokenness, but then, then he was like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. And the second time the cock crew and Peter called to mind the word that Jesus said unto him before the cock crew twice, that thou shalt deny me thrice. And when he thought therein, he wept. Remember, Peter, you were just in the garden figuring that the sword, the weapon, was going to be able to help save Jesus' life. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. You're going to deny me, dude. Three times before the cock crow twice. And then Peter recalled it. So there's some things we need to act like Peter. We need to be like Peter or not act like Peter. Be like Peter on some things that God said to us when he said, you need to let that go. You need to stop this. You need to stop that. You need to go this direction. You need to do this. You need to do that. And we know that God said it. We wrote it down. Because that, that was when we used to write down what God said. So God said it. We wrote it down. We just studied it. We just got a word on it. All that, 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 that. We need to bring those things back to remind so that we can be like Peter and get broke and begin to weep before God. Like you, I remember you said it. That's my heart. I know that was you. And begin to weep and break ourselves and repent and let God have it all. Hallelujah. The second thing about being broken. Broken people can crush other people. See, that's the bad side of the brokenness. You know, you heard it, you ever heard the saying, hurt people hurt others? Broken people, which goes back to ourselves, but we don't break ourselves and allow ourselves to be broken, we can lash out. Words is just so hurtful. Words hurt worse than bricks. But we say, stick, we, we used to say it sticks and stones and break my bones and words that never hurt me. No, no, ball, no words hurt more than them sticks and stones. Because the sticks and stones you can recover from. The words pierce. They get deep. They get deep. So hurt people hurt others. See, because we're born with fractured and dark hearts. Our intentions, our speech, and our actions divide, separate, and damage other people. We've all been on both sides of the coin, some to a greater degree and others to a lesser degree, but we can all probably think of times that we've hurt others when we definitely found ourselves as the victim of somebody else's hurt or somebody else's sin, right? When somebody betrayed us and played us, did us wrong, and we lashed out. Let us hold our words. Hold, let us hold our peace. Is it, the Bible says, don't let your good be evil spoken of. Evil communication corrupts good manners. Right? Don't cast your pearls before swine. Because they have turned and trampled on you. So let, let's, when, when the brokenness is beginning to happen within us, don't, 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 don't allow other people to have an effect to push that nuclear button mm -hmm. <laughs> and cause us to, to, to explode. Right? Uh, the other thing, the world is broken 
And if we're not broken to God, the world will break us. Right? No one gets through life without feeling the brokenness of the world. You know, it's so sad because I got some shocking news. They didn't die, no one, and mama gone, daddy gone, lost my brother, lost my sister. Get that shocking news. That's that's the, that's that's breaking this in the world. And now it is even worse of a breaking from the world when we know. Seriously, I don't care. I was telling my wife this yesterday. I said, why is it? I just asked a question. I said, why is it whenever anybody dies, it's automatically either they looking down on us or they in a better place. Why is it automatically that way? And some people we know. Man, them dudes was, them dudes was further away from God than Satan himself. I'm not casting nobody down. I'm just being real. But we automatically put them in heaven. Or put them with God. And, and, and don't say God took them. Oh, there's only two people. There's only three people really that I know that God took. One is coming back. The other two, the other two, the one was walking with God and God took him. The other one was walking with God and doing God's work and God took him. Talking about he not in Elijah, in Jesus. But it, even when God took Jesus, Jesus returned, resurrected. We're going to be talking about the resurrection, but this Palm Sunday, it's not like we get into some palms. And, and Jesus resurrected, came back, and then look, it said, He, and it said, God took you no more, because He said He laid down His life. And then look, we say the Lord took His life. But then it, when Jesus came back and showed himself with many infallible proofs that the book of Acts says to the disciples and to another 400, 500, he said, he, they watched him, they watched he, he ascended. The God was taking it back up again. And, and that was a demonstration on us ascending. Jesus. But that's, you know, don't, don't a lot of people believe in the rapture. Jesus said the same thing I do, you do, you be able to do the same and greater. But anyway, don't let, don't let reality scare you. And don't let, let the reality of stuff happening and transpiring and losing people to death in, in un, uncontrollable situations. When I say uncontrollable, it means you have no control over it. Circumstances, situations that occur in somebody's life. To affect you, to hold you, right? Let us keep our eyes and keep our gaze to Jesus. I mean, and there's nothing wrong with grieving. Jeremiah grieved all day long. Lamentation chapter three. Let, 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 look at Lamentation chapter three real quick. The Lamentation is right after Jeremiah. Because it was summarizing who Jeremiah was. The weeping prophet, as some called him. Look what he says. Jeremiah, uh, Lamentations chapter 3. Look, he starts out from the jump. I am a man that has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He has led me and brought me into darkness, but not into light. Surely against me he has turned. He turneth his hand against me all the day. My flesh and my skin have he made old. He has broken my bones. And he built it against me and compassed with me with gall and travail. He has set me in dark places. Now, you go read this yourself. And you're like, man, do I Jeremiah in my business? Because Jeremiah lived in this world too. Jeremiah said, I was stricken with the grief. I was stricken. I went through travail. I went through hard times. I felt like I was in the dark. I felt like I was all alone. Right? But then he goes on and said, the Lord is my portion though. He said to my soul, therefore will I hope in him. He said, even though this world is crazy and stuff I'm dealing with and going through has got me down and feeling a certain kind of way, God is my hope. And I'm going to trust in him. Right? He said, the Lord is good to them that wait for him. 
Too many times you might be going through brokenness and we're trying to get away from God. We're running from God instead of waiting for God. But yet, you're running from God, but you can't outrun God. Seriously. You, 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 you ever seen, remember, remember watching some cartoons or shows back in the day? It may have been some movies that was like that. Somebody would be running from somebody, and it's like, and they show up in front of them at the next block. Or why they trying to run? And they just show up. How do you get there? And they take off the other way. And they show up. How do you get there? It's like God is. He show up at every corner, every turn. Because you know what he's really trying to do? Stop running and embrace your brokenness. That's what he's saying. Stop running and embrace your brokenness. And then eventually, it's like they, they feel like, they, look, 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 God, ah, Jesus. God don't get tired. He said he's not sleeping there. He never gets weary. That's what the Bible says. Right? They running, they running, they running. And eventually, God just like, all right, well, I'm just going to let him. Look, 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 Jesus Christ, hallelujah. He stopped and just let them keep running until they run out of breath. And that's why we are saying in somebody's last breath, hopefully they call on God. But all through all of them years of running, why? Just stop running, embrace the brokenness, and now you can get fresh breath, fresh air, a new start. Old things has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. But you want to keep running. You ain't going to do nothing around our breath. God ain't going to run our breath. He's going to let you keep running. And eventually, he's like, okay, wait, oh, you're tired now. You doubled over. Lord, I need help. Help me, Lord. This is just too much. I don't know what to do now. God said, this is what I've been waiting for. I've been waiting for you to get tired of running. I mean, when people, seriously, some of us, when we came to church, what we say? I just got tired. I just got tired of going through the same stuff over and over. And God is like, this is all I've been waiting for. And then you get tired, and, and, and that's why we stand at the altar with every tear from our pinky toe coming up through our body and then coming out of our eyeballs. Snot, slobber, all of that. Because we just like, man, I'm tired. And, and, and doing that one instance right there, confession and believing of Jesus Christ and accepting him as Lord, in that one instance right there, you done almost went through your entire life in that instance thinking about the stuff that you was running from. Or thinking about the stuff that you was doing. And God is like, this is where I was trying to get you 15, 20 years ago. 25 years ago. This is where I was trying to get you when you was 10. When you was 11. But now here you are, 47. And now it's all coming to full head. Jesus. Hallelujah. Woo. We must have broken lives. We must have broken lives with an expectation of beauty. Ain't that something? Stuff that's broke don't look beautiful. We must have broken lives with unexpected beauty. If you expect the life of any renowned Christian, author, pastor, preacher, missionary, evangelist, whatever, you're going to find out that the greatest shape of their life didn't come in their moments of their strength, it came in the moments of their weakness or their brokenness or their struggles. I'm talking about me too, y'all. Right? Because God is a, is a redemptive God. He's a restoring God. He don't do stuff the way we think he should do it. He don't do stuff the way we want him to do it. And he does. But he's like, oh, you know, huh? you my child. You don't tell me what to do. Who do, you, who do you think you're talking to like that? All right. Same way we're being in natural, right? God is like that with the spiritual. It's like, oh, oh, you, you, oh for real? Hmm. Who do you think you is? I ain't saying you ain't nobody, but the stuff that you're doing, it, it, what? Huh? It ain't things in me. What? Say something else. 
<laughs> and God, I mean, we just got to embrace that. No, stop. Do it like this, Dad. You're embracing your voice at it. For one, I done did this. I done fixed stuff like this before. Two, this is your first time. Mm. Did you hear me? Mm. God is like, I didn't fix stuff like this before. This is your first time trying to fix something. You're not, let me, son, son, stop, 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 stop. Let me, let me show you how it's supposed to go and then watch me fix it. And after you watch me fix it, then you'll know how I fix it. And after you see how I fix it, then I'll help you fix it. But if you don't want to stand back and what and observe, oh Jesus, if you don't want to stand back and observe, man, everything that God does, I want to just stand back and observe because I don't want to do. Think about it. You want to get into a secular world job? So you ain't got to work so hard. You want to get into man upper management. Climbing the ladder of success. Right? So what? So you ain't got to get your hands dirty no more. But God don't mind getting his hands dirty in our life. So why do we mind Jesus? Hold the wheel, drive the car, get us where we need to get to. Why don't we mind standing back and observing and not getting our hands dirty in the things that's already killing us? And God want to fix it. Then we want to put our hands on it. Right? We want to put our hands on it. And God is like, take your hand, smack it. Get your hand off of there. I got this. But God, this is the way it's supposed to. I know how it's supposed to look. I have been through this before. Don't you know I've been through this? Not only have I seen it and I fixed it, but I physically experienced it myself. I'm talking about Jesus on the cross. Yeah. <laughs> I'm talking about Jesus in the garden denying himself. But yet, God don't know how to do it. We got so much experience. We just a teenager. We know more than God knows. But he's the one that gave us the breath to breathe. God said, what if God sit us down and said, okay, let's have a one-on-one. -on -one. Let's just talk. I, I, I ain't going to call you out on nothing. <laughs> I ain't here to dog you. I just want to ask you a couple questions. I, and, and look, they're personal questions, but I ain't trying to be in your business. So the first personal question I got for you, the first personal question I got for you, it ain't real personal, though. I ain't gonna ask you about your sin. I know that's personal. I ain't doing not that stuff. I'm talking about real personal stuff. How many blood cells you got? Oh, uh, that, that was a hard question. Let me, let me ask you something easier. Since you always take your selfies and you're always in the mirror, how many eyelashes you got? I mean, I, I mean you know. Seriously, how many you got? Uh, oh, my, my bad. Let me, I'm, I'm going to give you something a little bit easier. I'm going to give you something a little bit easier. Okay? Something similar. How many hairs you got on your arm? I mean, you, you can see them. Serious. I just want to ask you something that you know that ain't too personal, but it's personal enough. I ain't going to, not, not the stuff that's going to make you feel bad about yourself, but the stuff that make you think about, oh, what? You, uh, you going to the hairdresser? Let me ask you something before you go there. How many hairs strange you got on your head? Ain't that something? And God, but yet, we're trying to tell God stuff about us. And he's like, no, I know all about you. You're trying to keep me in a, in a room alone, locked away. You don't want to talk about me. You don't want to share me with nobody else. You want to just keep me in a room, locked away, and lock the door, close the door. Look, I seen something yesterday. We seen something yesterday. While we was at the creation music. It blew my mind, man. They had a door. Yeah, every kind of lock you could think on it. 
But you know, it's, you know what it said on the door? It's not safe out there in the world. I was like, wow, that's good. It says it's not safe out there. Actually, I'm going to tell you exactly what it said. But it, it, was just, it just blew my mind. I was like, wow, man. The stuff that we allow to go on and transpire, for real. Where is it at? I got it. I know I got it. Oh, there it is. It said, it, no, I said it's not safe out there. It had all these locks on the door. I took a picture of it because I said I want to share it. It said, the world's not safe anymore. Seriously. The world's not safe anymore. So I say all that to say, you're not safe with yourself anymore. So unlock the door so God can come on in. He wants to come in. But the, People don't want him in. Only when they only when they need something do they want him in. And God is like, what, really? You know, you used to have friends that you didn't feel like being around today. <laughs> and that's kind of how people do with God. Wow. Do you look? Man, I don't feel like talking to them right now. Seriously. I wonder how life will be right now. With all of this so-called tech, with all this technology, just take away caller ID. I wonder how the world would be right now. Wonder if they would take any calls. So God is like, I'm always calling. But you keep sending me the voicemail. I'm always trying to get in touch with you. But you keep on running. I reached out. I had an instant message you. I done text you, I done called you, I done emailed you. You ain't returning none of my communications. No, I forgot. You don't want to embrace brokenness yet. Hallelujah. But even in, even in the brokenness, God is like, no, I'm going to make you beautiful. I'm going to take this broken stuff. That is broke, that was meant to break and destroy your life, and I'm gonna make you beautiful. Are you ready for that? But see, to have a complete, oh Lord Jesus, to have a complete makeover, you gotta tear the stuff down. But I don't wanna tear everything down, Lord. God said, I need to get rid of your framework so I can do my artwork. Jesus is Lord. Right? If you want, if you want to, if you want to find out about a lot of brokenness in the Bible, look at Hosea. Let's read about Hosea. Seriously, he had to get gone. He had to go through a whole lot. He had to do it, but he had to stay open to what God was saying. Right? Then the last thing: if we broken for Jesus, a, a broken Jesus. Is for broken people. A broken Jesus is for broken people. Jesus is is brokenness. At Jesus, Jesus brokenness at its best visible form. Jesus is brokenness as an example for us, right? Jesus brokenness makes the worst of life. Bearable. <laughs> Jesus' brokenness makes the worst of life bearable. Like we can get through this, right? Because we're forever loved, held, and befriended by Jesus as long as we embrace brokenness. And he like this is like when I was just talking about God saying, I think no, that's Jesus. Jesus said, I'd have been through this. I know what it feels like to be betrayed. I know what it feels like to be denied. I know what it feels like to get played. I know what it feels like when your family don't want to roll with you. I know what it feels like when your family's questioning you. This Jesus, John, his cousin, John sent his disciples. 
Hey, Jesus made the great commission, said, Go ye into all the world and make disciples, right? John sent his disciples to go ask him who he is. As if you didn't know. You was in the womb when Mary showed up with him in the womb, and you got excited. You knew who he was. I'm talking to somebody. We'll experience Jesus and have excitement, but later on, after the excitement is worn off, and we think that we're doing what God said do, we forget that Jesus was the one that got us excited. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, Lord, have mercy on my soul. Jesus got us excited, and then we kept on doing what Jesus said do, and we lost the excitement, and then we start questioning who we think he is. Well, who is he? Is he the one? John knew he was the one, but he questioned. It's okay, though, because Jesus didn't take the questioning offensive. He didn't just go tell him, yeah, I'm the man. <laughs> he knows. He saw me when I came. He told y'all, behold, the Lamb of God, the one that saved the world. He told y'all. This is let him know, yeah, that's me. Jesus said, I know what it feels like when it seems like everybody's against you, except for those that are close to you. And even at times, those that are close to you is like, yo, how many times the disciples, we find the disciples murmuring among themselves about something that Jesus said or did. And Jesus still didn't get moved by that. He still continued to embrace the brokenness. Seriously. Didn't it say the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the center, even the bone in the barrel, and a, discern, a discerner of the hearts and the intents? <clears throat> Jesus is the word. John Munch told me Jesus is the word. So why, why would he know what we're going through, what we're dealing with, how we're going through stuff and experiencing things? Right? So what we're doing, what we're experiencing ain't nothing new to him. It ain't no shock. But when we're broken and we expose who he is, who, we expose who we are to him, not that he don't already know. He's like, look, sit back, watch. I know how to fix this. Take our hands off of it. All right. I'm going to round up with this. The meaning of brokenness in the Bible is deep and it's rich. It's gratifying and it's satisfying. It's hurtful, but yet it's full of joy. It's challenging, but yet it's triumphant. But when we embrace what the Bible says about brokenness, it really mends our hearts. It mends our hearts, breaks our spirit out and gets rid of our flesh. Really. And as we awake more and more to this brokenness and embrace more and more of this brokenness in the presence of God working in and through us, we find hope in knowing that our brokenness isn't pointless. Like there's a reason that you are sitting here today to hear about brokenness. There's a reason why the stuff that's transpiring, the challenges that seem so hard to come out, it, it's not pointless. There's a reason. Why does it feel like, look, look, see, why does it feel like get the feelings out the way because they fickle? See, you wonder why you feel like a certain way. God has said, because I'm trying to break your feelings. In another word, let me say it like this. God said he's trying to hurt your feelings. <laughs> so you so you can be numb to your feelings. Not that you become, become numb to how you feel or the way that people, when you interact with people on that note, God is saying, I just don't want you to be moved by your emotions all the time. You're so emotional. Somebody don't want to do something for you. You break out into a hissy fit. Somebody expresses their don't want to or their dislike. You get upset. 
You're so easily offended. I don't need you. He said, woe unto him with whom the offense comes. He said, the only reason you should be offended is to be offended in him. If you are offended in him, it's just like, well, Jesus got this. <laughs> no offense to me. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. One more scripture, then we're going to go. Mark. We are, go back Go back to Mark 14. Go back to Mark 14. We was just in Mark 14, right? Y'all wrote it down. You didn't write it down. Write it down. I was just wondering if anybody else was with me. If I was in Mark by myself. All right. Mark 14. Look, right here. Jesus in the garden. Brokenness. The example of brokenness. And they came, Mark 14, 32. And they came to a place which is called Gethsemane. And he says to a disciple, sit ye here while I, while I ask your pray. And he taken him with Peter and James and John and began to be sore amazed to be very heavy. Break the breaking, the breaking and the brokenness began to hit. It started to hit home. Like Jesus is like, oh, this is for real. Right? And he said unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And he went forth a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass him by. And he said, Our Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. How many times we going through something, we going through something, we know it's God breaking us down. We say, Lord, take this, man, take this. God's like, no, 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 I need to, you to get through this. Because if you don't get through this, then what I really want to do on the other side of this, I really can't do because you don't want to get through this. Because what I have is on the other side of this, it's over there waiting for you to arrive. You know, I have this confession. I said, purpose and destiny are awaiting my arrival. Their purpose and destiny sitting there like, where are you at? Where are you at? They're, oh, I got a glimpse of it. Come on, Nate. You can do it. Come on. Keep coming. Keep pressing. Ooh. Your perp. <laughs> destiny talking about perp. Your perp. He's like, yeah, the one, man. Your yeah, perp looking for him. Man, he ain't going to be all right. He ain't going to be all right. God got it. God's like, I like to talk about myself, man. And he went forth a little and prayed. He went forth. He still kept praying, though. And he come to find him, them sleeping and saying, but just Peter. He ain't talking. Nobody with Peter. Simon, sleep is thou? Couldn't stop thou watching out? Watching and pray, least she enter into temptation. The spirit truly is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed and spoke the same word. And when he returned, he found him asleep again, where the eyes were heavy. Neither which they want to answer. What to answer? And he coming the third time and said unto him, Sleep no more now and take your rest. It is enough that hours come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise up, let us go. He that betrayed me is at hand. That Jesus said, Look, the challenging stuff that's going on, it's okay. You can make it. You can get to the other side of it. What's trying to stop you is only is only going to push you further into me. But if you don't want to push, then it's going to stop you. What's designed to stop you is only going to push you further into me. But if you don't want to push, then it's going to stop you. What's designed to stop you is only going to push you further into me. But if you don't want to push, then it's going to stop you. Last analogy, we go. You ever been driving on the freeway? This is, this, this is the example or analogy of the push. You ever been driving on a freeway and you get behind a truck and the truck is just floating? They might be doing like 80, 85. You get behind that truck and you just catch the tailwind. They pulling you. 
They're pushing you further. And at times it's like they didn't pull you close to them. And now you gotta get around them to try to find the next one to catch the tailwind on. But it could have stopped you. But instead, you used its momentum against it to keep moving. All right. Hallelujah. Lord, thank you for the word today, Lord. <laughs> thank you, Father, for all that you're doing in and through our lives. Lord, thank you for us embracing brokenness. Embracing it, Father God, to move further. Embracing it, Father God, to get where you need us to be. Thank you, Father God, that we won't get in the way anymore. We deny ourselves. We take ourselves out of the way. And we thank you for it, Father. In the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, we give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Embracing the brokenness, man. Jesus. <laughs>